All right, so hopefully you know what this picture is. This is the moon, right? And so back, um, I mean, back since being in time, people saw shapes on the moon and, and looked at the moon, and, and uh, the moon looked very similar. The only thing that happened is parts of it would be illuminated and parts would not be illuminated, um, full moons, new moons, um, and crescents, and so forth. So when you're looking at this, this picture, uh, this, this uh, picture of the moon, and it's labeled here, the first people to come along and start labeling things were the Italians. Why? We're going to answer the question. Galileo Galilei. Galileo Galilei had, had, quote, invented a telescope. He didn't invent it, but he started pointing it at things like the moon. When you look at the moon, you're going to see features there. And so he started to see the features, and he started to try to figure out what they were. His impression was that there were great, vast, flat spots. And he thought about what, if someone's looking at the Earth, from far away, what would the flat spots look like? And he said, well, the only thing flat on the earth would be seas. And so he came to the conclusion that these were great seas. In fact, so when mare means mar, it means sea. Okay. This one right here, the Sea of Tranquility, this is where we landed. The very first people landed on the moon. Okay. And again, it looked like a tranquil sea to him compared to these other ones. And so they had the Sea of Storms and the Sea of this and the Sea of that. Here's obviously the frigid sea because it's got icy features in it, he imagined. And then he noted that there were some other things. He thought that there were volcanoes on the surface because so volcanoes come out of oceans. It makes sense, perfect sense. Here's a sea, here's a volcano. That's Copernicus, this is a volcano. And then there were other volcanoes down in this region, Ptolemaeus, and some of the other ones he got a decent look at. I can't see this hour, but it's right in here. And so that is how our first impression of it was, that there were vast seas and there were mountains in between. Now, the problem was it was clear. Again, remember, they, they thought these things were painted on a sphere, and this facing of the moon faced us all the time. Okay, It was constantly pointed at us, so we constantly saw the same side of the moon. And so the question at hand was, is that truly, is this truly, something painted on because if it, even though it looks like seas and mountains it can't be because it's pointed at us the same way as if a picture was being shown in front of us the whole entire time so we got over this how did we get over this there's a couple ways you get over this one you get better and better telescopes you start to look at more closer and closer and you realize eh, those really look like mountains okay the other thing that's interesting is you start to have these, these things that we've been calling phases of the moon. And when you think about phases of the moon, let's see if I can grab this. What's really happening here is the sun is way the heck over here. Essentially a point. Well, I don't think I drew that at all. Let's try it again. Essentially a point. And then you have the earth, which we'll describe as a blue marble. This has often been done so. Here's the earth. And the moon drifts around us. Sometimes the moon is here. 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 When this moon is right here, we get to see the sunlight from the sun hits that side of the moon. And so from our viewing right here, we see half a moon. It looks like only half is lit up. When the moon is back here, assuming the Earth is in the way, we'll talk about what happens when the Earth is actually in the way, we see the whole moon. We call that a full moon. This is a half moon. Again, the other half would be lit up. Okay, it comes back around. Because, again, the same facings towards us, right? So this side is pointed towards us. So that's the front side, that's the front side, that's the front side. And so the other side would be lit up when it gets to the other side, because this is actually moving to this side over here. And then on this side, we saw what's a new moon. What a new moon is, is this side over here is lit up, so we hardly see anything at all. In fact, the moon is very, very dark at that point. Okay? All right, so that's how we see the phases. Now, once you realize that's what's going on, it's very difficult to argue that this thing isn't a solid object in a sphere of some sort. Okay? And so that's one of the things that helped us get over it. You also started to make measurements of the sphere. Here is a relative scale between the two. Now, they're not, we're not this close to the moon. But this is how big they are. If you think about a basketball versus a tennis ball, that's about how the difference is. So we, the moon is fairly large compared to us. It's not completely teeny tiny. Most moons are quite a bit smaller 
uh, than the planet they go around. And in our case, our moon is very, very large. It affects us in large ways, like moving around tides, which indeed may be one of the reasons why we have life on this planet. So it's very good we have a, a very large moon. Okay. Some other features of the moon. Well, again, let's talk about the moon. The moon has a size of the radius and 1.74, no, 1,740 kilometers. Since we're about 6,400 kilometers, you can make that out to be roughly three times bigger in radius, which again is what this is. And you're like, wait a second, so that's not one third the size. Well, it is one third the radius, right? If this is the, this is the radius here, this is the radius here, it's about right in terms of one third the radius. Uh, but it makes us much, much smaller. If you think about three dimensions, you go R cubed, it's 27 times smaller in terms of total volume. Now, we also know if you put something in orbit around something, you can determine what the mass of the object was. There's great projections, all sorts of random things. But we finally uh, started launching some probes. Actually, the first probes blew right past it, taking pictures. Uh, Russians slammed one in the surface just to see if they could hit it. Eventually, the Russians started launching probes that would go around the moon, okay? And when they went around the moon, they could actually get the mass of the moon, the uh, mass of the moon, for the mass of the moon, not horrifyingly important, but the density is interesting to us. The density is about 3.3 grams per milliliter. You're like, that means nothing to me, Mr. Resney. Thank you for that great bit of information. Well, the Earth is about 4.6 or 4.7 grams per milliliter. Iron is five grams per milliliter, roughly. Uh, things like uh, water is one gram per milliliter, okay? So it's less than us on a relative scale. We're very close to the density of iron. We're not very close, we're, we're closer to the density of iron. Uh, the, moon, the moon is somewhere much lighter, so it must be made of much lighter stuff. In fact, it's projected that the vast majority of the moon and after we went there and took some samples, we discovered that the moon is basically made of the same stuff as the surface of our planet. That it has a very, if it has a core, which it does have a core, we'll get to that in a moment, uh, it's much, much smaller than ours, right? relatively speaking. Our core is like very, very, you have to go very deep into the earth to suddenly realize there's a core underneath. We're talking about the continents are floating on pools of molten lava. That molten lava is, is heavier metals, and so therefore, the, the bottom line is the uh, the density of the Earth is, is basically premised on the stuff that's on the inside. The inside, vast majority of the inside, is very heavy metals, including things like uranium and things that are much, much heavier than uh, even iron. Um, so, some of the things we need to know about the moon. Uh, let's talk about why the moon is locked in this position and talk about how we get to this. Let's, uh, I need another slide for that, so hold on. So our next slide here is, this is a, a shot taken by the Galileo spacecraft, which was on its way to Jupiter, took a picture of the front side of the moon and the back side of the moon, and the back side of the moon relative to the Earth. Remember, it, one side is pointing towards us the whole entire time. The side pointing towards us is this one with those big old seas, those big old, big old mares and seas. And you can see part of the front side of the moon here. But what is this? It's completely different. This is the back side of the moon. And what is the back side of the moon? Well, look at it. It's cratered to heck and back. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is that the backside of the moon is initially named things like this. This, uh, these, these craters, especially near the equator, are all named after Russians. Gagarin, Lenin, Volkov. All of these, these craters on the backside, the big ones on the backside of the moon, are all named after Russians. You might like, well, why is that? Well, keep in mind, this side is always facing towards us. Therefore, there's no way to see the backside. How's the first time somebody saw the backside of the moon? The Russians finally invented a probe and went around the backside of the moon and took pictures of the backside of the moon. When the first person there gets to name everything. And so these things were named after Russians. So I think you know about the backside of the moon is look at the craterage. This is pretty darn smooth compared to this side. This is the same camera at roughly the same distance, right? This is... Like this, if you look at this, the, the diameter of the moon, it's virtually the same thing, right? So what the heck is happening here? The backside is getting pelted with craters. And those craters have to come from what? Well, they're not volcanic in activity, so therefore, what are they? They are impact craters. These are what happens when you get hit by an asteroid or even a comet. These rocks coming down from the, from the moon 
have slammed into the back side of the moon, the point that part that's pointed away from us for a very long time. Okay. And that is, uh, and that is what's going on here. Okay. And so there's that. Now, some other things. When you land on the moon, you're going to discover something very interesting. When you're standing in the sun, you're basically in a microwave oven. There's no atmosphere to protect you. Well, so one other thing, there's no atmosphere on the moon. There's no atmosphere to protect you, so you're basically standing in a microwave oven. So the temperature on the side that is pointed towards the sun is 260 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cooking, right? The backside, well, there's nothing, no light on it. There's no air to trap in the heat, so the backside gets cold. In fact, it gets to negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So we go from 260 on the bright side, where you basically stand in a microwave oven, to the back side, where you're standing in basically pitch space darkness, and it gets to 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, negative 280 degrees Fahrenheit. You need to know that 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 you know, without a spacesuit, obviously that by itself would kill you. Not black air wouldn't be helpful either. Okay, so why does this look like this? What is going on here? Well, let's let's uh, let's take a moment. Go back to here. Um, we are always facing one side of the moon. So as the Earth, we have the luxury of looking at the same side of the moon. And the back side is with all the craters on it. The front side is pretty much shiny and pretty and pointed towards us. There's craters on it, by the way. It's not like it doesn't have any. We saw them, right? Uh, but the back side is always crater. What is going on? And the answer is pretty darn simple. The moon's been protecting us. Let's say you're an asteroid. You're coming along. Woo! Oh, look, Earth. Which side of the moon are you going to hit? You're not going to come whipping through and go, woo, at least not very often, and slam that side, right? You're going to come in. Poof. And so the back side of the moon has been getting pelted. What's interesting about this is it suggests that the Earth, which is much larger, remember we're 27 times the volume, and much more massive, so we have much more gravity, should have been hit at least as hard and at least as often, probably more often. Probably, not probably, definitely more often. Where's our craters? Go and dig yourself a little hole in the backyard. Little one. Come back and see it in three months. What happened to it? Rain. Wind. Even more so, our craters, we don't even make some of the craters. Why? Without an atmosphere, the moon, even the tiniest rock, strikes the surface at 30,000 meters per second and makes a cute little crater. On the Earth, we call them falling stars. Why? Because they burn up in our upper atmosphere. We see them come in. You can see the falling pretty star. That's basically the rock burning up in the upper atmosphere. Our atmosphere protects us from most rocks. Not from most rocks. From a lot of rocks. Okay? Therefore, it takes a really large rock to make it all the way to the surface and leave a crater. Okay. Uh, recently, there was one in Russia. It was approximately doing this off the top of my head. Well, they're still they were still debating it last time I was looking, but maybe seven meters across. It didn't make it to the surface. It burned up on its way in. It broke into little tiny pieces and burned up. And so that atmosphere is protecting us from getting cratering to begin with. If we do get cratered, if we do get cratered, it doesn't leave a it doesn't stay long because erosion will take care of it from the atmosphere. The moon has a history. The moon has its history there. There's nothing to get rid of it. One of the fascinating things we think has happened is our astronauts walking on the surface of the moon have left moon prints. We think if we go back there, those moon prints will still be there. It's hard for us to understand after 50 years, somebody's footsteps would still be there, but without any air, without any rain, anything to weather it, why would the footprints disappear? All right, so I'm going to need to pause this video and uh, make a part two.